Today, we're going to learn how Discord handles 26 million real-time events per second and how it stores trillions of messages. The information in this video comes from the synthesis of multiple articles I found in the Discord and Elixir blog, which are gold mines for people like us that like to look behind the curtain and learn how things work. The original version of Discord was built in just two months and it was launched in 2015. For real-time messaging, which is the core of Discord, they used Elixir, a functional programming language. And for their API, they used Python. Elixir is a functional programming language that runs in the Erlang VM. Erlang is like Java in that it is a programming language and it also has a virtual machine that other language compiled to. Like Kotlin and Scala run on the JVM, Elixir runs in the Erlang VM. Erlang was created in the mid 1980s at Ericsson for building telecommunication systems and has been in production ever since. Powering GPRS, 3G and LTE mobile networks worldwide. That means that Erlang is built to power robust, low latency, distributed and fault tolerant systems. Erlang is incredibly reliable and battle-tested. The best example of this is the legendary Ericsson AXD301 ATM switch, a high-speed device used to process, convert, and forward packages in telecommunication networks. AXD301 was the first commercial use of the language, and it had over a million lines of Erlang code. What is impressive about it is that it achieved a high availability of nine nines, which is crazy. If you have five nines, which is good, your service will be done for about five minutes in a year. If you get seven nines, which is amazing, your service will still be done for about three seconds in a year. AXD301 achieved nine ninths, which means that it was done for only half a second in over 20 years. Insane. Now the question is, if Erlang is so good, why choose Elixir? In a way, Elixir is like Kotlin and Erlang is like Java. Erlang is seen as a dinosaur and Elixir is a newer language. People like the syntax of Elixir compared to Erlang because Elixir looks more like Ruby and seems friendlier to newer developers. Elixir also has newer packages and has been made more popular thanks to frameworks like the Fiend Phoenix framework, which is like Django or Ruby on Rails for Elixir. Elixir may be popular and trendy today, but that wasn't the case back in 2015. In a way, the Discord team took a risk by choosing Elixir back then. Elixir version 1.0 had just come out, so it was a young project and it was impossible to predict what would happen to the language and its community. Fast forward to today, Discord is running 500 Elixir machines to power the chat messaging system that pushes dozens of millions of messages per second and handles more than 12 million concurrent users. Concurrent meaning active users interacting with the platform simultaneously at any given time. What is even crazier than those numbers is the fact that the chat infrastructure team only has five engineers. The fact that they don't need teams of dozens of people monitoring and putting out fires goes to show how resilient and reliable Elixir and the Erlang VM are. The reason why Elixir and the Erlang VM can handle millions of users all connected at the same time is because they are designed at their core for massive concurrency. In Elixir, concurrency is possible thanks to Erlang processes which are created terminated and run by the VM. Erlang processes are extremely lightweight compared to the traditional operative system processes and threads. Each Erlang process is isolated from each other and each process has its own memory space and garbage collector. Processes can communicate with each other by sending messages but they don't share the same memory, which is great because it means that if one process dies, it won't take other processes down with it. The Erlang VM can have hundreds of thousands of live processes running at the same time, with the default limit being 200 and 62,144 per machine. In the case of Discord, using an Erlang server called Cowboy, each HTTP request and each WebSocket connection is managed by a separate process. The thing that runs the tasks of a process is called a scheduler, and schedulers have a queue of the tasks they have to run. The Erlang VM runs a scheduler with its own queue for each core of the machine by default, which means that if you have four cores, you get four schedulers. To run many tasks in parallel, the VM has a load balancer that distributes tasks evenly among schedulers running in different cores. And that is how Erlang achieves concurrency and parallelism. Now that we know how thanks to Erlang and Elixir real-time messages are sent and received, let's talk about how messages are stored. MongoDB was the database that Discord started with, but it wasn't the database that Discord would stay with much longer. They started with MongoDB because according to them, it is one of the best database for iterating quickly. They started with a single master and replica set, and they did not want to use anything more complex than that because they knew they will eventually have to migrate. This is part of the company culture according to them. Build quickly to launch and test a product feature, keeping in mind to always have a migration path to a more robust solution later. When they reached 100 million messages that they data and its index could not fit in RAM. So it was time to migrate. It was time to call the lady with the blue eyes, Cassandra. 
Unfortunately, Cassandra will also not last at the Discord, and they will eventually have to move to another database again, but more on that later. Cassandra is a NoSQL distributed database known for being able to handle petabytes of data across multiple servers. The way Cassandra works is pretty cool and easy to understand. Each instance of Cassandra is called a node, and you never just run one node, you run multiple nodes next to each other. When Discord started to use Cassandra in 2017, they were running a cluster of 12 nodes with a replica factor of 3, each node storing an average of 1 terabyte of data. They quickly grew to run 177 nodes with an average of 4 terabytes of disk space in 2022. With Cassandra, a big block of data is spread across all the nodes with each node having a small piece of the data, also called a partition. When choosing how to partition the data, it's important to get it right. Ideally, you will want to put the data that is related close to each other. This way, when you need to read the data, you don't have to search for it in each node and take a long time. To keep related messages close to each other, Discord partitioned the messages by by the channel they are sent in, along with what they call a bucket, which is a 10-day window. That means that Discord put all messages for the same channel sent in a 10-day time window in the same partition, so they can be close to each other, making reading easier and faster. In Cassandra, reads are more expensive than writes. Writes are written in memory and eventually saved to disk. But to read data, Cassandra needs to read the memory and potentially read multiple files on disk. And reading from disk is slower than reading from memory. As we said before, all messages of a channel in the same time window were all stored in the same partition. That means that at peak times, when the users of a popular channel all wanted to read the latest messages, a single partition received a huge amount of requests, creating what Discord calls a hot partition. A hot partition is a partition that is getting so many requests that it becomes overloaded and starts to take longer and longer to respond, which means that requests start to accumulate, causing it to fall further and further behind. Hot partitions slowed the nodes they were hosted on, which means that other queries to the node that has that hot partition were also slow. Because the problem was that one partition was getting lots of requests all at the same time, to fix it, they created what they called a data service. And they put this data service in between the requests and database. The data service was written in Rust, and its job was to absorb the requests and protect the database from being overwhelmed. The data services do something called request coalescing, which means that if multiple users are requesting the same thing at the same time, the data service will detect this and only query the database once. So if someone sends a message to add everyone in a Discord server, when thousands of users go and check the message, they would not cause a hot partition, since the data service will query the database only once and give the same message to all. After deploying data services, they were still getting hot partitions in Cassandra, but not as frequently. This is why they decided to migrate to ScyllaDB, a Cassandra compatible database written in C++. Because Cassandra was written in Java, it has a garbage collector, which caused its fair share of latency issues. ScyllaDB, since it's written in C++, does not have garbage collection, making it more performant than Cassandra. The initial estimated time to complete the migration from Cassandra to ScyllaDB using the ScyllaDB migrator was three months. There were trillions of messages to be migrated, but still, three months is a long time. To make it go faster, they decided to rewrite their data migrator in Rust. And using a combination of checkpoints and SQLite, they were able to go from three months of estimated time to nine days. For nine days, they were migrating 3.2 million messages per second. With the combination of ScyllaDB and the optimizations from the Rust-powered data services, there are no hot partitions anymore. And because ScyllaDB is a much more efficient database, they went from running 177 Cassandra nodes to just 72 ScyllaDB nodes. Each ScyllaDB node now has 9 terabytes of disk space, a big increase compared to the typical 4 terabytes per Cassandra node. Fetching historical messages took between 40 and 125 milliseconds in Cassandra, and now with ScyllaDB it takes 15 milliseconds. Writing a message took between 5 to 70 milliseconds in Cassandra, and it now takes a steady 5 milliseconds with ScyllaDB. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. Your subscription means a lot to me. It motivates me in doing research and creating quality content every week. So please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. The Discord blog is full of other articles talking about why they replaced Go with Rust, how they combined Rust with Elixir, and how they use React Native to power their iOS and Android applications. If you want me to make a video on those articles, let me know in the comments. And if you like these kind of deep dives into the backends of some of the biggest websites in the world, also comment down below what company you would like me to do next. Thank you for watching as always. Onjana, Kamsahago, Sarang Hamida, see you on the next one. Down my bio. Bye bye.